Welcome. This video is going to take a look at the environmental implications of acids and bases. So rainwater is naturally acidic. It's not seven like most people think, but CO2 will dissolve in rainwater and make it slightly acidic with carbonic acid, H2CO3. So rainwater that's acidic down to as low as 5.6 is not really concerning, but when it falls below 5.6, that's when we refer to it as acid rain. And the new term is actually acid deposition, which refers to any kind of precipitation, whether it's wet or dry, that has a pH below 5.6. So there's two main kinds of acid deposition. There's the wet acid deposition, which you probably know mostly as acid rain, but it could include sneets, sleet, snow, hail, fog, mist, or dew, any kind of precipitation, wet precipitation that ends up on the ground. And then there's also dry acid deposition, and that's when the gases fall to the ground as dust and smoke, and then they later get dissolved in water to form the acids. And these gases are also known as acidifying particles because when they combine with water, that's when they make the acidic uh, deposition. The two big culprits in acid deposition are SO2, sulfur dioxide, and then the nitrous oxide compounds. And sulfur dioxide comes mostly from burning fossil fuels and especially coal. Heavy oils to some degrees, but in this country, coal is the big culprit. And coal is usually burned these days to produce electricity. SO2 is also produced in smelting, which is a process they use to extract metals from ores. Um, and 50% of all SO2 emissions each year, though, are from coal, so mostly producing electricity. Once we get sulfur dioxide, which is just going to be the result of sulfur and oxygen combining, um, then you form H2S, and that can go on and form H2SO3 or H2SO4. So we have both sulfurous and sulfuric acid resulting from the SO2 emissions. The nitrous oxides, the two big ones, are NO and NO2, but there are other nitrous oxides like NO3. Um, but both these oxides, NO and NO2, come from the internal combustion engines, which is what uh, powers our automobiles. So automobiles by far are the biggest contributors of the nitrous oxides. And the reason it's a problem is because usually nitrogen in the air is non-reactive because of nitrogen's triple bond. But car engines are hot enough to drive this endothermic reaction. So the air around the engine, or as the exhaust, the hot exhaust comes out the tailpipe, um, it heats up the surrounding air to make this NO and NO2 form. So it's not actually the engine doing it, it's the heat with the surrounding air with all the nitrogen and oxygen in it that creates this. And then NO2 will go on to mix with water and form nitrous and nitric acid. So both sulfur and nitrous oxides form through some um, variety of things, but the bottom line is these are the primary pollutants that end up in the four uh, acids that we primarily see damage in our environment. And uh, this little graphic here just shows how it gets carried off into the atmosphere. What I really wanted you to see here is how these pollutants just become part of the water cycle. They follow that same cycle of evaporation, uh, condensation, precipitation, but the big issue is right here is that the acid clouds can travel hundreds of miles from where it forms. So for a long time, the people creating acid rain weren't worried about it because the winds and our natural weather systems carried the pollution away and it was somebody else's problem. And that's still an issue today that pollution often ends up away from its source and creating problems for people who had nothing to do with its you know, its origination. So what are some effects of acid deposition? It has negative effects on materials, like in buildings, statues, etc., plant life, water, and human health. So starting with building materials, marble and limestone are the main things affected by acid deposition. Uh, marble and limestone are forms of calcium carbonate, and both SO2 and H2SO4 react with the calcium carbonate to form calcium sulfate. And the problem is twofold. Calcium carbonate has a very low solubility in water, but calcium sulfate is more soluble, so it'll wash away over time. And calcium sulfate is slightly bigger in volume than calcium carbonate, so it causes some expansion and creates cracking, which then lets the water in to wash away the more soluble calcium sulfate. A similar reaction can happen with nitric acid and calcium carbonate to form the more soluble calcium nitrate. 
Um, metallic structures are also vulnerable to acid deposition, especially iron and aluminum, because most metals react with acids because hydrogen is less reactive than the metal, so you have a single replacement reaction going on. And with nitric acid, the problem doubles because nitric acid, instead of releasing hydrogen gas, actually releases nitrous oxide, and so you put more NO into the atmosphere, which creates more nitric acid, so uh, it keeps driving the cycle. As far as plant life, the big effect is that acid rain slows down plant growth or even causes the death because acid rain causes minerals like magnesium, calcium, and uh, potassium ions to wash away, and those are the good ions for plant growth. That's called leaching. It leaches or washes those away, and at the same time, it causes more aluminum ion to be released, which is toxic to plants and damages the roots. And a third issue is the dry deposition can actually land on plants and block their stomata, which is the little pores that allows gases and moisture to move in and out. So not good for your plants. Impact on water is acid rain can cause a lake to be dead, which means it's unable to support life. Fish like perch and trout are a little more um, sensitive than some of the bottom feeders. Um, but they can't survive below a pH of 5.6. So anytime we have acid rain falling on a lake or a body of water and that pH dips below 5.6, we start seeing various species dying off. At a pH below 4, even rivers become dead. And that's because of the high amount of aluminum that will leach into the water from the rocks in the riverbed. And that aluminum not only kills plants, but it blocks fish's gills and doesn't allow them to take up the oxygen they need. Another process that happens is eutrophication, which is really just the death of a lake. Um, but this is slightly different. It's not where the, the fish and plants die off because of the leaching of aluminum and the low pH. But eutrophication is where you have a lot of nitrates ending up in the water. And you get an algae bloom, which you're probably familiar with in Minnesota when the lakes get green uh, toward middle or end of summer. And then this algae bloom leads to oxygen uh, depletion, and then more algae blooms, and then sunlight can't get to the stuff on the bottom, and it just goes over and over until the algae basically um, uses up the oxygen, blocks out the sunlight, and everything ends up dying in the lake. So what's the impact on human health? Well, acid rain doesn't impact our health directly. I mean, it would if you're drinking right from the source, but most of us aren't. But the dry particles of sulfate and nitrate can be inhaled, and these particles will irritate your respiratory tract, increase the risk of asthma, bronchitis, or emphysema. In fact, in big cities, the uh, number of kids with asthma is just astronomical because of the air pollution. It can also irritate your eyes. The other problem is the release of aluminum ion along with lead and copper ions into our drinking water is a health risk. And this is what we're seeing going on in Flint, Michigan, all the stories we've heard out of there that they're not doing anything to filter out these uh, heavy metals. Um, it's creating all kinds of problems, especially the lead um, is especially bad for humans. So what's the response? Well, way back in 1852, there was the link made between industrialization, you know, more industry and pollution, but little attention was paid until the 70s. And even in the, in the 70s, um, the people complaining about the pollutants weren't the ones making them. The people making them saying it's not a problem for us. So since the 70s, it's been an ongoing political issue. But the two main things they do now is a work on reduction of SO2 and nitrous oxide emissions. And SO2 emissions can be reduced by removing the sulfur before you ever burn the coal or oil, which is called pre-combustion. Or you can remove it after you burn it, which is called post-combustion. So pre-combustion, there's two options to pan upon if the sulfur is by itself or if it's in a metal compound. Metal sulfides are insoluble in water and they're dense. So if you just crush up and wash the coal, those metal sulfides won't dissolve in the water, they'll sink to the bottom because of their weight, and you can just rinse them out of the coal that way. Otherwise, there's a process called HDS, or hydro desulfurization, which is just what it sounds, sounds like. You add hydrogen to remove the sulfur, and what it does is the hydrogen bonds with the sulfur to form H2S, which is a highly toxic gas, so you need to capture that gas um, as you create it, but that's okay because you can then, then use the H2S to form sulfuric acid, which you might remember is a really heavily used chemical in industry. Post-combustion is they treat the 
the fumes as they come up the snow, smokestack or the flue, and it's called flue gas desulfurization. And just like it sounds like, it's removing the sulfur in the flue as the gas moves up. And what they do is they use a wet slurry of calcium oxide or calcium carbonate, and that reacts with the SO2 to form that calcium sulfate. And then, again, um, they can remove 90% of the sulfur dioxide with that, and they can use the cal calcium sulfate to make other products like plasterboard. As far as nitrous oxides, uh, these are removed by two common methods from automobile engines, since that's the main contributor. They use catalytic converters, which um, all cars in America have catalytic converters on them, and they're just what they sound like. The engine exhaust passes through the converter, which is kind of in the middle of your vehicle underneath um, along the tailpipe, and it uses a catalyst to convert the NO back into harmless gases. So the equation is showing here that it takes CO, which is also a pollutant, and NO, and combines them to form CO2 and N2. The other thing is to use lower temperature combustion, which just doesn't allow the NO to form because there's not enough heat for it to form. And they do this by recirculating the exhaust gas back into the engine and allow it to cool down before it's released to the atmosphere. Other options are just plain to reduce our use of fossil fuels, use public transportation, use alternative fuels, etc., just to reduce the emissions. And then um, another option is they treat bodies of water that have been acidified by using lime or calcium hydroxide, and we do this with soil as well.